Good morning, church. Welcome to Chapel Next. So what we have here is brave souls that have um, braved the cold weather and have come to worship Jesus this morning. So we're, we're really glad you're here. So this is Chapel Next. This is a place where we, where we focus on fellowship and, and biblical preaching out of the Word of God. We believe Jesus is who he says he is, and we believe that the Bible is the holy inspired Word of God. Um, with that, our, our announcements this morning, um, we are postponing going to the Bible Museum until sometime in March. So it's going to happen, but we're just postponing it um, for a little bit. Our, and then our youth group right now is meeting um, virtually. So if you want to get involved in the youth group, we're meeting virtually for that. And so that is our announcements this morning. So I'll, I'll open us up in some prayer. Heavenly Father, we're going to take a step back and we're going to give you this time. So no matter what we have going on, the craziness of Sunday, the, the snowstorms, whatever it is, we give you this hour for us to focus on you. So Lord, give us exactly what we need today. Restore us, refresh us, equip us. We give you this time. We give you our hearts. We give you our minds. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with us, and uh, we're going to worship together today. Uh, just, uh, you know, as we come together, how many of you, God has done something good for you in your life? Okay, I think that's all. How many God's done something good for you in the last 10 days? Amen? Amen. All right. Well, today we're going to sing a song. It's called Great Things, and we're going to just worship the Lord together. Here we go. Oh, hero of hell. 
conquered the grave but you free every captive and break every chain oh god you have the great thing we dance to your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have the great thing you have the God, you do praise this morning. Lord, we glorify you and we thank you. Father, we worship you in this place today. We lift up the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Oh, you've done great things for us. We glorify you and praise you today. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty place, a treasure in the faith, I never enough. You came along and put me back together. satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you My failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Oh, the God of the mountain, the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace.
God praise this morning. Just lift up your voices to Him. Lord, we glorify you and we honor you in this place today. Oh God, the battle belongs to you 
and every fear I lay at your feet and I'll sing through the night oh God the battle belongs to you Lord we just glorify you and we thank you in this place today Lord, that your will is done in us and everything and everything that we say and do. God, we know that you fight our battles. We know, Lord, you've done great things. And God, that you turn mourning into dancing. Lord, as we open our hearts to you today to receive what you have for us, I pray, God, that you would change us. Every week I ask the same thing in this service, God, that your word, your worship, the time that we spend with you would go into our hearts and would transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, I just give you all the honor and praise today, and I thank you for every family that's here, for every family that's represented. God, that your will is done in them. Lord, that your peace that passes understanding just fills this place today. I pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You may be seated. Sunday in a great way. Now, um, we've reached this time in our worship service where we're going to receive our morning tithes and offering. Um, and how we do that um, here at Chapel Next, um, we come forward um, and we drop our, our tithes and offering um, into this box if we want to do it in the physical form, or you can give online as well. But the time in the worship service for tithes and offering, it's more than just coming forward and, and giving a, a portion of our resources. We, we're supposed to introspectively look at our, at our resources, what, what we have, and, and thank God for the blessings that he's given us. If we're looking at our, at our time, if we're looking at our money, what has God given us? And how are we using that to expand the kingdom of God? Are we being wise stewards of the resources that God has given us. So as I pray for our tithes and offering, let us just evaluate ourselves and, and how we're spending our, our time and how we're spending our money. So God, today, as we give you this hour, as we give you, give you this time, we also thank you for the ability to give. So Lord, here is, here is a portion of, of our money that we are giving back to you. And we're giving it freely. We're giving it with, a, with an open hand to expand the kingdom of God. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So the next couple minutes, you can come forward and place your offering in the box.
Thank you, Brother Joshua, for those uh, beautiful notes. And uh, this is a great time to worship the Lord. We know we've got some snow maybe coming in, but God's in control of all of that, right? Um, so we're in the book of Genesis still today. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and uh, turn there. And what we're looking at right now is a sermon series entitled Powerful Pre-Incarnate Passages, okay? Um, so Genesis chapter 18 is where we're hanging out today. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. If you're a Bible novice, um, you just crack it open to that first book you see. Um, it's, in, in, it's labeled as Genesis. Turn to chapter 18, and uh, we're going to talk about a section of Scripture here in a minute. Um, but the question uh, might be, why are, we, why are we looking at this series? Um, because uh, the Lord has consistently had interaction with mankind uh, since man walked the earth. And so uh, the more we know about the Lord who loves us, the better. We're, we're generally in the church fairly familiar with the account and the things that have happened in the Gospels. But a lot of times we're not as informed uh, in the Lord's long history of uh, being with the people that he loves and interacting with us. So that's going to be the focus over the next few weeks going into uh, uh, Easter or Resurrection Sunday. And we're going to talk about the resurrection uh, after that, not just on Resurrection Sunday, but uh, going into the Passion and then after that. Because how many of you know, after the resurrection, the Lord walked the earth for 40 days and then there was the Ascension and then afterward Pentecost. So We'll try to put that into perspective in a timeline and talk about it for about 40 days or so. All right, so that's kind of where we are. And today, um, there, well, there's uh, last week we talked about um, our, our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. And um, we saw that, that, you know, God called out to them when they sinned, that God uh, made them garments of skin. So there, there was a sacrifice there, the shedding of blood of an animal, we assume, uh, uh, on their behalf, uh, and then uh, God guarded the way to himself, uh, to the tree of life um, as well. So that's just a little bit of a review of last week. You can check it out. Um, I'm trying to put things on YouTube uh, now so that you can have a very clear uh, video to, to go back to. Uh, so you can go back on uh, YouTube or uh, Facebook Live last week and see that, that message if you missed it. Okay, uh, so let's let's take a little bit of introduction before my brother uh, reads. Uh, this week, we're looking at a man by the name of Abraham and a special interaction that he had with God. Okay, so uh, a man who lived in a land that's a little bit mysterious as to where it is called Ur, uh, which is is in the Iraq, Iran vicinity and. God called this man out of where he was um, to go to the land that we now know as Israel. But back then, it was just another uh, land of people that, that were not uh, related to Abraham uh, uh, as, as, as far as a Hebrew is concerned. And so uh, God called Abram and he made a covenant with him. He was an older gentleman uh, who had no children. He was a merchant and he was very wealthy. And God told him that he was going to bless him. And Abram spoke back to God and said, um, how can I be blessed when I don't have an heir? Uh, Eliezer, my servant, is going to receive all of my everything I've got. And God said, that's not going to happen. You, someone that comes from your body, your child, your son will in inherit what you have. And your wife, Sarah, in her old age, will give birth to a son. And even in 2021, a lot of women can relate to that, that they may not have a child. A lot of men might be able to say, I don't have a son. Uh, most people can relate to that. We're past the childbearing age. Doc says we can't have kids. We're used to that. Uh, well, God did a miracle. And uh, uh, where we're looking in, in, in chapter 18, the miracle had not happened yet. But God made a covenant with Abraham and the Lord himself came and uh, there was a covenant between God and Abraham where Abraham slaughtered animals and, and cut them in half. That was a custom of the time. 
and open them up, and then God walked between these slaughtered animals. Uh, and in the process of all of that, he put Abraham into a deep sleep and told him that your children uh, that, that come out of your body will be enslaved for 400 years, and, uh, but I'm, I'm going to bring them out of it. Uh, there's a lot of things that have happened, so you're going to have to go back and, and read on your own time because today we're only looking at a small section, all right? Um, so, uh, so what happened? What else happened? Abram had a nephew named Lot. And Lot and his family were very prosperous also. So Abraham and Lot could not reside together because of all the flocks and herds they had. All right. So Abram said, look, uh, our, our ranchers and all those folks, they're arguing with each other. So let's, let's spread out. Go wherever you want to go. And so uh, Lot chose to go to where Sodom was, all right? Now, I know we look back like, why did you go to Sodom? Sodom was very prosperous. It was a lush area. And that's where he figured it would be easy for him to go and continue to be a merchant and cattleman or whatever he was doing. So that's where he went. And Lot, um, excuse me, Abram went in another direction, okay? Well, the problem is that Sodom and Gomorrah were involved in the greatest wickedness uh, that, 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 that people can be involved in. If you want to know what Sodom and Gomorrah were like, read Romans chapter 1. Okay? Romans chapter 1 describes the fall of man when we hand wave God and we, uh, we, we, we go in another direction. Okay? And I'm going to elaborate on that here shortly. Well, God was going. We all know that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, okay? But I think that we are missing a lot when we say Sodom and Gomorrah were involved in same sex and God destroyed them. <laughs> There's a lot that we're missing in between that, okay? So let's take a look today at why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and why he and Abraham had this conversation, and what does that mean to us? And, you know, why is Abram, it seems like bargaining with God. This is a, a, an interesting and almost mysterious pa uh, passage, but if we unpack it a little bit, maybe we'll get some understanding for today and how we should govern ourselves as far as God's future and plan for us. All right? So uh, Brother Ben's going to come up, and he's going to lead us in a responsive reading. You can look here or however you want to do it. I got my uh, word right there. You can do it that way, however you want to do it, brother. Actually, you can do it there. It doesn't matter, but it's right up there, and you got it, bro. I got it. Thank you. Good morning, chapel next. Let's read together. I'm going to read it from here. Okay. Let's read it from there, I guess. We've got too many things going on. When... The men got up to leave. They looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. The then Lord the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Where I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him. To keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is it so great and their sins so grievous that I will go down and see this is bad as the outcry has reached. If not, I will know. Amen. Thanks, Ben. Awesome job as usual. Okay, uh, so today uh, I've entitled this message, and you don't have to hang out on the title, but for uh, easy remembrance, I've entitled it God's Righteous Judgment. Okay, God's Righteous Judgment. Now, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, uh, using a little bit of alliteration today, okay? <laughs> so let's see if yeah, the smart art came up. Um, so... Um, 
at the top bar, you're going to see this three more times. At the top bar, you're going to see God's attribute. Okay? And on these two blocks, on the left, you're going to see what the Lord has shown us in the passage, or at least one of the things that we can glean from the passage. In other words, some theology. And on this block, um, I am going to tell you pastorally my recommend, recommendation on what we should do about it. Okay, the so what, as we say in the army. Um, and so all you got to do is remember O's and P's. All right, you got to hear a lot of P words <laughs> and three O words. The three O words are my three points. She's already on it. The P words are me just kind of elaborating on that. Okay, so if you're a note taker, um, this is kind of at the end of your section. Okay, there'll be four P's before it, and this is the so what. All right, hopefully that'll become clear in a second. So let's, let's um, circle back for a second. What's happening? God has come. There's three visitors that come in, in chapter 18, and they visit Abraham. Abraham's already had his uh, uh, covenant uh, with, with, with God as far as the Lord walking through the animals, like I said, that have been slaughtered. He's already been put in the deep sleep. Uh, if, you, if you're in chapter um, the chapter before this, chapter 17, the covenant of circumcision happens, which is new, all right? And so uh, there's multiple covenants that Abraham has with God. Lot is down there in Sodom. Stuff's pretty bad, and the Lord comes, and there's three visitors. Now, I'm already going to tell you the three visitors are not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? We don't serve multiple gods, all right? This is not a plural uh, uh, God that we serve. The Lord comes to visit with Abraham, and there are two angels with him. That's the three visitors, all right? So the three visitors come, and how many of you know the Lord can appear any kind of way he feels like? He's not limited to when he was born uh, uh, of, a, of a virgin and then uh, lived 33 uh, approximate years. That's, he's not limited to, to coming here in that capacity. Even now, he's not limited. In that, he could come any kind of way he wants. And this particular time, he comes and he eats with Abraham. Actually, Abraham doesn't eat. He, he prepares for them and stands under a tree and as the three visitors eat. And there's two angels, and they're eating the food that is prepared. The Bible says, even in the New Testament, it says, uh, be careful how you treat strangers because you might be entertaining angels without knowing it. <laughs> so uh, what's the, the first uh, uh, O there, to make it kind of easy, is the word omniscience, okay? Three O theology words that were thrown at me when, when I was in seminary. I'm, I'm giving them to you. Most of us have maybe seen these before. All right, so omniscience, all right? God knows everything. You and I do not know everything. So-called theolo theologians don't know everything. Uh, PhDs don't know everything. Uh, scientists don't know everything. God is the only one that knows all. He knows everything about eternity past. He knows everything about what's happening right now. And God knows everything about the eternal future. God has come out of eternity past and he, he's living now and he will live forever. None of us can claim that. None of us can claim, yeah, you know, when, when the earth was formed, I was there hanging out. No, you and I were not. We know nothing about how the earth was formed. And so when scientists date the universe, allegedly, and they date the earth and they date the solar system, you know, they're, they're just, they're spitballing. It's a theory. That's all it is. And they're probably wrong. And they've changed over time. They get data and they're like, no, it's this old. And the earth is this old. No, it's formed this way. There's a new theory. God knows exactly. He knows all. And in the case of Abraham, he comes to him and he says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? 
Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. All right. Now, before we get to the so what, I'm going to give you four P's that aren't on the, on the thing. So you got to listen for them. All right. Um, so so God talks about this plan that he has for Abraham. We're talking about omniscience. God knows the plan for Abraham's life. Abraham already had a plan. Remember, he was going to give his things to his faithful servant, which wasn't a bad plan, but it wasn't God's plan. We can learn from that. Can we not? God has a, a plan. We have a plan. Sometimes they mesh. Sometimes they don't. When our plan doesn't mesh with God's, chuck it. Okay. And people always ask me, how do I know what God's plan is? You got to interact with the one who has the plan. Got to turn off the internet and the TV and spend a little more time, a lot more time in God's presence. Abraham was physically hanging out with God himself. And you and I can hang out with the Lord. We can, but we've got to get rid of the world in our lives. God's plan was there. He talked about also second P, purpose. Okay, so not only does he have a plan for Abraham, but he has a greater purpose for him. And he says um, that, that all nations on earth will be blessed through you, through one person. You never know what centuries of the Lord tarries, centuries from now, God's going to do through you. You never know. Brother Mark might have all kinds of uh, praise and worship 200 years from now that Mark Morgan singing will be the standard in some country. You just never know what God has for you. He's saying, no, no, that's not it. Not God's plan. But you never know what God has for you. Abraham had no idea that it would be like this for him. That's the purpose. God gave him a promise. That's the third P. He promised him that his offspring would be a great nation. Remember, he said you have more than the sand on the seashore created from the dust to the ground, biological descendants. More than the stars in the sky, spiritual descendants. Those who believe. We're all children of Abraham who we believe. So he has earthly descendants. He has spiritual descendants to this day. He's the father of all in the faith. And only those who are his biological descendants who believe in the Lord are truly his descendants. That's why Jesus, when he was here on earth, said, you're of your point at biological descendants of Abraham. And he said, you're of your father, the devil. See, Jesus helped us to understand that those who follow his way are the ones who are his children. He also gave him prophecy. That's the fourth P, okay? He prophesied through this passage that he would destroy the wicked and protect the righteous. Now, uh, my sister, if you could pull up that, that slide, okay? So God talks about plan, purpose, promise, and prophecy, right? Um, so he sh he's giving us a paradigm. That's the theology that we're seeing through his omniscience. That God knows everything, and what's the paradigm? The paradigm is that God protects the righteous before destroying the wicked. That is a paradigm that we see throughout the scriptures, that the destruction of the wicked does not apply to those who God, through his grace, he, he saves. So God's children are not subject to judgment, but those who reject God are subject to judgment. See, it's not your individual sin that is what takes you to judgment. <laughs> because if that was the case, we'd all be lost. What, what causes us to go to judgment, and this is the greater problem in Sodom and Gomorrah, is that they had completely rejected the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That, that was the problem. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm echoing over there. This is amazing. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, the, the AV is working. That's what that means. All right? So God is omniscient. Let's look at the second O. All right? The second O 
is the word omnipresent, okay? Omnipresent, all right? Omnipresence, if you want to say it that way. What did God say? Why was he there, okay? And you, you might, if you read through the passage, God doesn't say out of his mouth, hey, I'm about to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Abraham picks up on it. They're walking and, 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 and there's a conversation and, and, you know, Abraham is thinking about Lot, who's his nephew and his family. And he's, he's, he's saying, would you destroy the, uh, uh, you know, a city for, for 50 righteous? Okay, so he's asking uh, these questions. And what we see is that, uh, you know, Abraham knows what's about to happen. How did he know that? Um, personally, I think those angels were, were dressed like they meant business, like warriors. I don't know for sure, but unless there's some conversation that is was omitted, which is possible, um, I think he saw that they were ready to rock, so to speak. Okay, um, when I was in Iraq, one of my battalion commanders uh, said, "Hey, the the." The posture that we're going to have is, is great hanging out with armor when you're, when you're fighting in an insurgency. My, my commander was from California, and he always used to talk like this. And, um, you know, he said, we're going to go where we want, when we want, and how we want. <laughs> that's exactly what, what, what we did. But, but it was the aggressive posture of an armored unit. And so I, I think that there was an aggressive posture with this, this group uh, that, that Abraham uh, saw, you know, and so God, God says that the petitions that came before him, the prayers that came before him, this is the first P, um, is what he heard, and then God decided to to project. Okay, he he he, he had a torch party. Was, uh, if you know what a torch party is, military uh, speak, he and the two angels were the torch party. Pardon the pun. Because there was a, a torture that was about to happen, not the kind of way we talk about it in the army, but um, the three of them came, and uh, that was the that projection was the uh, a party of three. And what did he discover when he got there? People's hearts were polluted. Okay, um, there was prayers that went to him. God decided to project forward. He came with a party. Two of them were the warriors, the angelic warriors that were going to handle the business, and. God discovered pollution. Let me say, read it the way the Lord said it. He said the outcry, this is in verse 20, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Now you might say, man, God didn't know. He didn't see the scripture says what it says. God knew, but I believe God can absolutely choose to, to, to not hear, see. You ever you heard about hear no evil, see no evil? Is it God, you know, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, but, you know, God has eyes that are angelic. <laughs> and he sent the angels down there to go, go hang out. So it's just like a commander. If a commander says, I'm going, he tells his general, the colonel tells the general, I'm going to go and I'm going to sweep this city. He's not going to physically go sweep it himself, is he? If he's a brigade commander, is he going to do that? No. But he's going to send soldiers to go do that. And that's what the Lord did. The Lord did not physically, while he was with Abraham, walk down there in the city, but those angels went. So when the Lord says, I will, sometimes he's sending his servants to do it. <laughs> Okay, just like when he said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. Well, Abraham had to do something in order for that to happen. He had to believe God that he was actually going to have a child. And he and Sarah, we got kids among us, had to participate in this. You got it? So sometimes you and I have something to do with the Lord's will. And in this case, Sodom and Gomorrah were so polluted of heart and mind because they had rejected the true God that they had involved themselves in all kinds of lasciviousness. And it got to the point where men only wanted to be with other men, and it was even worse than that. 
They were involving themselves in gang activities. We have kids among us because that's what they were going to do with the two angels. So they thought. They saw the two angels and they, they went to uh, a Lot's house and, and said, where are these men? Because we are going to, and you'll have to read it for yourself, okay? A horrific thing that they uh, uh, were doing in those cities. But when you reject God, your mind goes into all kinds of uh, pol pollution, sewage of the heart. And you'll do anything. Because you don't have the ability, you've rejected the true God. If I reject the true God, if I reject following him, then Jameson will go into the worst things imaginable. It starts in the mind, and then it goes to the heart, and then it goes to action. That's how we are polluted as humans. And the only way we can be pure is through God's grace. God's grace is what causes the purity in us, not of our own selves, my friends. And every single person there in Sodom and Gomorrah could have had the almighty God as their savior. Every single one of them. The Lord said it as, as Abram is talking. He said, what about for 50? Lord, you know, forgive me for speaking to you again. What about for 40? See, um, the, the, not only is God omnipresent, don't forget the Lord walks among us, okay? Uh, so that's uh, the, the, the little chart there. He has presence among us. So what should we be doing about that? We should be going towards purity, okay? And, the, and uh, with, because God is omniscient, we need to prepare. He's telling us what to do, um, so we should keep the way of the Lord. And because he's omnipresent, he can be wherever he wants to be at any time. We need to be living a life of purity. The scripture is very clear as to what purity is all about. As far as intimacy goes, that is designed only for a husband and a wife. Okay, A man and a woman coming together in matrimony. That is where uh, intimacy is um, sanctioned by God as a holy covenant between a man and a woman and God. Anything outside of that is beyond the scope of what God permits. And, and the Lord is present among us. You see, when you read the book of Revelation and you see um, all of the eyes in the wings of the, the cherubim, it's, it's not a, a monstrosity that it's describing. It's describing that God, the, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. You're not going to be able to, I'm, I'm not going to be able to go to the Lord, you know, before him, before judgment and say, I didn't do that. <laughs> there, was, there was probably angels recording and, and physically present. The Bible says what's done in darkness will, will be shouted to the, at the rooftops. There's nothing that is done in secret that will not be concealed. It's almost as if this life itself is a test for you and I. And this God that we serve wants purity. It's not an option. It's not something that we do when we turn 78 and a half. <laughs> it's something that God wants now. The Bible says, uh, Paul said it this way, that our bodies should be living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. You see, we are the church, and the, the term church comes from a word, ecclesia, ek meaning out. So those who are called out, called out of what? Called out of the world in its pollution. Lot, the Bible says, was a, a righteous man. He had some strange uh, behaviors, but uh, he's described uh, as, as, a, as a righteous man who was grieved by what was around him. And you and I should be the same way. We shouldn't be enjoying <laughs> what the world enjoys and loving what the world loves. If, if so, where's the purity? Where's the coming out from the world and its ideals and its philosophies? You know, I was uh, on, on YouTube and I took a look at uh, a, a video that had been digitally remastered. It was just a, a, uh, a vehicle that drove around in Los Angeles in the 40s. And that's how some of the camera crews would practice 
and they, they put scenes uh, behind the actual film. So they just drive through LA um, or wherever they were and just film people. And then they take that and they put it in the background of movies. But now in 2021, they're digitally remastering those, putting them in color and slowing them down to the correct speed. And you can see what life was like um, in the 1940s. And, you know, people were, uh, and, and believe me, in the 40s, people had problems. But, uh, you know, people were much more clean cut. Uh, they were, uh, you know, respectable <laughs> as far as politeness. It was just a different world. It looks like you're going to literally another country if you see those. We've degraded uh, what we think is regular, just basic decency in 2021. The things that we do and the things that the media puts out and the things that are common uh, practices um, would have been disgusting um, back, back in those days. Um, and believe me, like I said, we weren't sinless by any means. America had a lot of problems in the 40s. But um, so purity, we should be the standard of purity, those who follow Christ. The standard of purity. If somebody wants to know how to behave like a child of God, they should be able to look at me and look at you and say, that's it. That's a follower of, of, of Christ. That's where the word Christian comes from. It does not come from any follower of Christ that that call their congregation that it comes from the world looking at believers and saying those are those Christ followers they're 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 Christians that's where it comes from you only find it three times in the new testament and each time it's referring to what the world says about us and that's a compliment to be called that but know that to whom much is given much is required so if we're going to be called that then we should behave the way the lord did Purity is so important. Remember that the Lord is with you. When we're saved, what happens? The Spirit of God is given to us, and the Holy Spirit is inside of us. So omnipresence. God is always present with the, with the believer. Abram and, and the ancients, they looked forward and wanted this, what we received. They didn't have the Lord living inside of them. They didn't have that. They looked forward to it. Now we have it, and, and God forbid, we take it for granted, don't we? We take for granted that the Lord of the universe lives inside of us. God have mercy on us. Lord have mercy on us for forgetting that God lives inside of us as believers. If the Lord came to your house and had dinner, and I, I think of a general officer came and had dinner with you, you, you and I, would we'd lay out the, the red carpet for a general officer. What about a head of state? You know, pick, pick your favorite country. If you think that here's the greatest country, whatever it is, you know, and that head of state came, you know, to your house. What if the Queen of England came? You know, what if, what if one of the, uh, 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 you know, our, our, the dignitaries from one of our partner nations, the, the president of South Korea came, you know, to your house? How would you treat them? You know, what about the God of the universe sitting down and having dinner with you? Well, he does every day. How do we treat him, my friends? What's the last word? The last word is omnipotence, okay? Uh, God showed his power. God's all-knowing, omniscient. He's all-present, omnipresence. And third and last, he's omnipotent all powerful God showed that he was all powerful you see here's four Ps for you all right Abraham was probing God he was asking he had an idea of how he could bargain to keep Sodom and Gomorrah from being destroyed he saw those two angels leave and he's like they are absolutely going to destroy that city <laughs> That's going to happen unless God tells them not to. I, I, don't, I don't think if I, let me ask God if he, if he won't destroy it for 50. Surely there's, you know, 50 down there. Maybe there's like 25. I can start at 50 and work my way down. He was probing God. Um, he was, uh, he had a, in his mind, a probability. God probably will not destroy the city if there's 20 righteous down there. And there's probably 20 righteous down there. Friends, let me tell you something. There are fewer people that believe in Christ in this country than you think. 
Whatever you think the number is, it's probably fewer. The Lord said, wide is the road and heavily traveled to destruction. My grandmother always reminded me of that. But seldom traveled, rarely traveled. You ever been on a trail, running, running trail, biking trail, all by yourself early in the morning? That's the, that's the path leading to righteousness. And few obtain it, the scripture says. You know, few obtain it. The parable of the sower. Remember we talked about the parables? Four different types of soils. Four different types of hearts. Only one of them is the one that receives the good soil. Even if you use that probability, you're talking 25%. We're talking world numbers here. Okay. I don't know what the number is. I'm sure that there's higher percentages in certain areas than others. But uh, what we saw in the parables, if you remember, that every time you have God's children, you have Satan's children right there. Seeds being scattered, the birds are eating it up. You know, the parable of the, the weeds and the wheat. Remember that one? Seed was sown of the word of God. And then where did these weeds come from? An enemy did this. Always there are others out there that are evil. And in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, there weren't even 10, my friends. Not even 10 in two major cities. But God had patience as he listened to Abraham ask. God had a conversation with Abraham because it was a good conversation. It was good for Abraham to understand just how special his children are, those who choose to do what is right. It's important for you and I to understand that and to understand how rare God's kids are. And that's why it's so important for us to, to tell people about the gospel, to go find them. Go find those people that believe. It may be very hard. You might have uh, just a, a few here and there. You know, uh, uh, my, my brother, uh, there's another Morgan over here, um, you know, who's frustrated. He's like, we're trying to get these Bibles to folks, and it's, it's kind of challenging. <laughs> yeah. You know why it's challenging? We don't have enough of God's kids that are movers and shakers in the Army to make it happen. We got some. We don't have enough. So God had patience. All right, here's the only word I had to look up. I needed one more P. All right, this was a, this is, I didn't know this was out of my head. Potentate, all right? Potentate, that's a, that is a sovereign ruler. God showed that he's sovereign. He's the potentate, not Abraham. Abraham, as mighty as he was, as great as he is in the faith, in Hebrews 11, he's given a lot of, <laughs> a lot of time in Hebrews 11 in that hall of fame of faith. Talks about Abraham over and over. But even Abraham did not understand that there were not 10 righteous in that city. And believe me, I could take you to some cities that's probably not 10 righteous there, even today. There's some cities that are just, they're, they're going to be destroyed. If you read the book of Revelation, if you read the prophecies of the prophets, the Lord's going to come back. And the earth will mourn when the Lord comes back. You see, remember the paradigm? God is the righteous judge. This is our future here on earth, that God will judge. People don't like hearing it, okay? Uh, here's your two Ps there. Um, really kind of three on this one. All right, so uh, last uh, uh, point with omnipotence. If you go one more, brother. I said, sister, you, you've been clicking the slides all the time. What a horrible chaplain I am. I mean, this guy never missed Bible study, and here I am. I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> brother Brandon, thank you. All right, so protection and punishment, okay? This is what we're seeing with God's omnipotence here. That he does punish the wicked, but he protects those who love him. Don't forget, okay? So I know there's a bunch of P's and O's thrown at you. You need a, a, a backup and a hey, chap, too much of that. No problem. The Lord saw the wickedness that was in these two cities because people were praying to him and saying, it's awful down here. <laughs> Probably Lot and it, and was one of them. And what the Lord did was he went down to see how bad it was. And yes, I think our God can, can if things can get so bad that he's not looking at it day to day personally. Because the, the Lord looks out for his righteous. He's probably playing, paying more attention to his children. I can't explain it all, but I know what the Bible says. He went down there and said, I'm going to go see. 
<laughs> just like with the Tower of Babel. We're going to go see what it's all about. God has a way of doing it. But he protected his children. Those angels snatched Lot and company out of there. They didn't want to leave their home. They didn't want to leave their stuff. They didn't understand. They had not had the conversation that Abram had. And those angels had to grab them literally by the hand. And only four were, were initially brought out of it. Only Lot and, his, Lot and his daughters actually, you know, lived because Lot's wife hung out weeping for her city. You know, she wanted to go back. She didn't, she didn't get out of there like the angel said. And she was killed with everyone else. But God punishes the wicked. He does. So what's the so what on that? You and I need to preach the gospel. We need to preach that there is a coming judgment for those who reject God. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that we have a holy God that came down and he saw that it was so uh, 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 horrible that not a single person was going to produce a, a righteous individual. In fact, the opposite was going to happen. The Bible says that the men came out from Sodom young and old. That means the old men, the elders, were teaching these younger men and, and the middle-aged folks like me. They were, they were blessing off on that horrible behavior. And you and I both know there's places in the United States we would not dare let our children or our wives or the, the weak among us go because it's so awful and horrible and the things that are happening. Just turn on the TV and watch the news. Not the, uh, the, the, the national news, the local news. Go to the local news stations and see what's happening. They're just reporting. They're not putting a spin on it. They're saying this literally happened. Awful things that are happening. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah was as bad as you could get. And God said, the only way to prevent the world, world from getting worse and not going back to Noah's day is to destroy these two cities. And the scripture tells us that this paradigm is going to happen in the future. You know what Jesus said? Here's a shocker. He said in the end times, it's going to be, get this, worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Jesus said. Can you imagine that? Can you envision that? Folks who don't believe in a rapture, listen, folks. This is God's paradigm. He takes his children out before judgment of the world. He does not judge his children. Now, I know I'm throwing a lot at you here today, a lot to think about. And I know this is heavy. But our God, this is, this is his word, it's not mine. Okay? Read, Revela uh, read uh, Genesis for yourself and take a look at Revelation and compare the two. Stand to your feet with me. I know that I've said a lot, and if you're watching this on the internet, take a moment to hear this. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever might believe in him should not perish What's he talking about with perishing? Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked do not have the opportunity to have everlasting life. See, he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whosoever might believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life, my friends, is a gift from the almighty God. That is nothing you and I can earn. Just receive it. Two easy invitations today. You don't have to remember all the O's and the P's. It's just a different sermon today. What you need to remember is that God loves you. That the wicked will be judged. But God's children are given what's called a pardon. And he will not give us what we deserve even though we sin. All we need to do is believe. I'm a product of the 70s, old school preachers who told us about heaven and hell, that God would punish the wicked. And they were 
trained and preached to by old school preachers from way back in the day, from the 18th century. And they all said that only Christ is the way. The same message that I've been receiving consistently from our chaplains here in our core, from the local preachers online that I listen to, the message is the same. Only Christ, my friend. Only Jesus. The last invitation that I have, and I'm, those two invitations are, are open invitations for when we dismiss here shortly, to come see one of the chaplains. One is to receive Jesus, and the other is what I was telling you about what we need to do. If you already believe, prepare yourself. Purify you and your family preach the gospel don't just receive Christ to get a heaven ticket make sure that you are sharing the word of God with others would you pray with me Father God we recognize and confess that judgment is coming the scripture says it the prophets told us the paradigm is there in the scripture but thanks be to God that you have told us you save your children from judgment because eternal life is the gift that you give to those who believe. Lord, if there's one person here who doesn't know what to do, they want to be with you, but they don't know what to do, Lord, I pray they will remember what you said in your parable. The simple prayer, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just sing this together with our benediction today. you and keep you make his face shine upon you and give you peace god bless you guys have a great week tell somebody about jesus this week live the life of purity preach the gospel amen, amen. god bless you